Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Fedway Associates, Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation, Cone Resnick, providing accounting, tax, and advisory services for more than 90 years. New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Verizon Communications. And by the law firm of Gibbons PC. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Dr. Amit Trivedi is attending surgeon, Department of Bariatric and Laparoscopic Surgery at St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Good to be here, FC. We're doing this program in May of 2013. Interesting time. Uh, Governor Chris Christie has uh, announced to uh, the world. The world. Everyone, the world seems to be interested in this subject, but this subject will be interesting to a lot of people after this, that he has had a certain procedure done, and that is a lap band procedure. Right. He's had uh, lap band surgery to help him with his weight. Uh, he's been struggling with it for many years, as you know, and as he's publicly said. And he's come to the point where he felt he needed a surgical solution to his uh, weight. Why don't we do this? Explain to folks, as our cameraman Steve Barcy um, comes in on this, exactly what you're showing us. So these are the actual lap band products, okay? And there's two companies that make a lap band or a gastric band product. One is the Realize company, which is this one, and the other one is the Lap Band company, which is this one. And they're essentially the same product, similar to a Coke and Pepsi type thing, okay? Um, and basically what a Lap Band is, is a belt buckle with a balloon that's inflatable on the inside. Got it. The balloon is adjustable through this tubing, and this tubing is connected to a fill port, and the fill port is placed underneath the skin in the convenient location. So right in the office, the Lap Band can be adjusted. It's placed laparoscopically through a couple of tiny little incisions in about a 40, 45 minute procedure around the top portion of the stomach. And what it does is it partitions the stomach into two little segments. One is an egg-sized stomach portion, and then the rest is the big portion of the stomach. So as food comes down from the esophagus, it has to fill up this little egg-sized stomach, and before it can go into the rest of the stomach, it's gonna have to go through this opening. And this opening can be adjusted right in the office, depending on your appetite, to help you lose weight. I said something to you before I, uh, I came in here, that um, into the studio for this interview. I said, you know, I was running around. I didn't get a chance to eat very much. So I grabbed a, uh, a muffin, okay? And I said, uh, or it was a chocolate chip muffin. I'm right, I'll admit it. <laughs> and I said, you know, I couldn't have this, you know, if I had this surgery, uh, you said, this procedure. You said, that's not an issue because... That's not necessarily an issue at all. When the lap band is tightened, there's a very small opening in the center, and soft, moist, mushy foods that are usually in high calorie, like muffins, donuts, munchkins, potato chips, milkshakes, will go through the tiniest of openings, and you will not lose a drop of weight. But the problem is with what kinds of food? So, there should be no problem with any kind of food if it's well chewed. Someone says, all right, I'm gonna go for a big steak. Right, and that's the classic example of a type of food that will get stuck. Most people don't chew their steak well enough, and if you have a very small opening into the rest of your stomach, the steak's not going to fit through there. And it's gonna sit up here, giving you a very uncomfortable sensation. And that's your cue to say, I've had enough and I should stop. But in and of itself, I mean, the governor, when, when he did this, made it clear that he knew he knows mm -hmm. that he still has a lot of work to do. And by the way, there was a certain procedure he did not get. Let's make it clear. Right. And, and you've performed both. I think there were three procedures, There's in fact. Exactly three. So what weight else? loss surgery in 2013 is basically refined down to about three procedures. The gastric bypass, 
done laparoscopically, is the gold standard. That's a small stomach pouch and a short circuit of the intestine that helps you lose a significant amount of weight. So that's one. Then there's something called the sleeve gastrectomy. That's where we partition the stomach into a long tube like a sleeve. That uh, helps you eat less, and we actually remove the hunger hormone producing part of the stomach. So those two things in combination work beautifully to help you lose weight. And the third is purely a restrictive procedure mm. called the lap band procedure. But the governor made it clear, and this is not simply about the governors, we're trying to learn yep. as much as we can. Be the governor has done this, has drawn public attention to it, so we're saying, hey, listen, let's learn about this. The governor said he did not want to have a more aggressive medical procedure. He thought a riskier procedure, um, which is the... Right, the sleeve and the gastric bypass. Okay. He's so correct in that. He is correct in that. The lap band has the best safety profile, so it's fully reversible. Right. We're not cutting the stomach. We're just wrapping this product around right. the top portion of the stomach, and it's fully adjustable, so you can work with your lifestyle. By the way, what is stomach stapling? Stomach stapling is a generic term for a whole series of operations like the gastric bypass or the sleeve. But it's not a thing in and of itself. But it's not a thing okay. in and of itself. But here's the thing. For Governor Christie and anyone else who has this lap band surgery, what kinds of things do they need to do to have the maximum, most right. the po positive benefits outcome that we're looking for? That's an excellent question. So what I've learned in over a decade in doing this is that it's not just about the surgical procedures. There's a whole component preoperatively during the surgery and postoperatively that ensures people's success. Preoperatively, we tend to enroll everyone into a multidisciplinary preoperative teaching and exercise program that helps people lose weight, get into the right frame of mind, learn the proper diet protocol. What do you mean frame, frame of, What does frame of mind have to do with it? <laughs> Food is so ingrained in our culture that if there's changes that are be, to be made and things that may or may not work and this transition period where you can't eat everything, that's going to have an effect on you. You don't want someone to say, I had weight loss surgery and I regret it, because the health benefits have been clearly defined for these operations. They save lives. They add potentially a decade to one's life expectancy. So the benefits are clear. We have to get patients to understand what they're volunteering for and give them the best preparation. So in my program, I make sure that they have access to dietitians. I pay for them. They have free access to it. They have access to a psychologist. Mm. They have access to support groups if they don't want to talk to physician types. They have access to what we call a rehab program, which is an exercise physiologist that works with them to help design a program for them. Because a lot of our patients, because of their weight, are almost embarrassed to go to regular gyms. So here we have something for them, because we need that. By the way, you have a relationship at St. Joseph's, but also at? At Hackensack University Medical Center. And, and by the way, picking the right physician to do this is critical. These are very technically demanding operations. There's a lot of subtleties to it. You want to make sure that you pick the best technical surgeon for your job, and you got to make sure that you also have a good support system that goes around with that program that you choose. So we've worked over the last decade to refine our program based on a lot of patient feedback that's, and what, they, what their needs are. But someone saying, hey, I did the lap band, I'm good. That's the wrong attitude. That will never work. So there are concerns, and there are patients that have had the lap band, but they never come in for an adjustment. That will never work. Now, I'd like to show you an adjustment so Real that quick, people have a good concept of what it is. So there's a balloon on the inside of this uh, ring. And through this tubing, I can inject saline, which is essentially water, to inflate it. So here, I'll inflate it. And you can see how the opening goes from that size to pretty darn small. Mm. And if it's too tight, I can loosen it or adjust it to down tighter. Why would you do this? to find the right balance. And the right balance actually changes if you get a cold, if food gets stuck, it's easy enough to loosen it. But you want the patient to lose a certain amount of weight per week, not too much, not too little. What would be that optimal? Well, we try to produce about a pound or two a week. It doesn't sound like much, but it's between 50 and 100 pounds in a year. Wow. And that's a significant amount of weight that this product can and produce. And if someone's not doing that, you make the adjustment. Right, so initially, we leave it wide open. Once the swelling from the surgery is gone in a few days, usually we do the first adjustment at the one month mark. We finally, uh, finally, I have to do this. The governor has said publicly he is not looking to be a role model for anyone else. He's looking to do this for his family, for his wife, for his children. Right. And he turned 50 in September of 2012, uh, and he wanted to do this for his health, for his right. family. But is it not a fact that a lot of people looking at what he is doing could learn from this? 
And that's essentially true. No matter how hard he says that he's doing it for his family, which is very true, he is a public figure. Yes. And public figures, whether they like it or not, get looked on as role models in both a positive and a negative way. So people will be watching people him. People will learn from this. Right. And people can relate to it, too. Here's someone who's achieved so much in life, yes. but yet has trouble with it. And has admitted to struggling with exactly it. Exactly right. And I'm glad that he was able to do that because we're finally, finally getting to accept in America that this is actually a disease just like every other and not a character flaw. No. And I think that's an important distinction that we as physicians, you as media, and certainly the governor has to make. It's not a character flaw. The factors that contribute to one's obesity are so multifactorial. You cannot say it's just a character issue. Dr. Amit, we treat uh, it as a disease. Sir. Dr. Amit Chavetti, a lot of people may want to just talk about it because it's a topic in the news, but to learn more about it, the complexity of it, the multifaceted nature of the subject is, is much more important, and you have helped us do that, and I want to thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Stay right there. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. We are proud to introduce uh, the $50,000. That's the biggest prize there is at the Rustbury Awards for Making a Difference. Our $50,000 winner, Regina Coyle. And Regina, were you surprised when you were recognized? I was. You're, you're caught up in the moment of everybody's wonderful stories. You have all these great people talking about what they do, and um, you feel a little bit insignificant compared to some of the other people. I mean, I help people in a flood, and that was I was there at the right time. But these people who uh, do wonderful things constantly is just, you just sit there and you go, okay, who's left? <laughs> <laughs> well, Regina's actually not doing a very good job describing what she did and why she was recognized. Describe uh, the, the organization you're connected to, the parish house we were talking about. Well, I, I'm, I'm uh, the trustee at St. Margaret of Cortona Parish and um, in Little Ferry, New Jersey. And it actually services Little Ferry and Wunaki. What we were actually doing was... Um, after Hurricane Irene, uh, we had had a problem because people would not leave their homes. With that. That's a flood area, right? That was a flood area, and people would not leave their homes because they had animals. So we decided, with the help of my pastor at the time, Father Art Humphrey, to make this, if we needed it, uh, animal friendly. So in all the classrooms, we made tarps and papers and had dog bowls and had secured everything so that if push came to shove and this woman decided to hit us really hard, Sandy, we were prepared. Um, we were actually, my um, boss, because it's a voluntary organization, was Detective Craig Hartless, and I had been up in uh, Mount Fuji, um, something at Felicia, and we had gone for Halloween, a celebration, and a murder mystery, and we were planning what we were doing there. And uh, we cooked. Um, when we came back the next day, we had cooked enough food, we had had everything prepared. We were ready. We were ready. We were ready for anything. We were ready for the storm. But... but after 125 people and animals in their classrooms and everybody's secure, we had to evacuate within 15 minutes because the berms blew. Explain to the folks what that means, the berms blew. Nothing never, happened, never before, happened before, and so happened. all of a sudden, it's like the levees go. Absolutely. It's a, you know, you read about how it happened in New Orleans and how it happened in other places, but it was us this time. And you heard the raging water come through, and we had 15 minutes of, um, to get these people out. And then a little ragtag group after that who did not fit on the bus stayed there for about three hours on top of tables as the waters rushed into the hall. Did that mean everything that you had prepared was ruined? Um, the food, a lot of the food and everything, the stoves were gone, um, the, the cots we had put up on tables, which we had set up for dinner, um, but a lot of the stuff got hit when it moved from the force of the water. I mean, it was a very vicious water as it came through. So you don't give up at that point, do you? Yeah, I, refuse. I refuse. What do you do? I'm a little Polish, a little bit Irish, and I refuse to do it. Um, and a lot Catholic? Yeah, a lot Catholic. Um, my, I checked on my folks who were on one part, side of town. I knew and Their my, house was adversely affected. I had six feet of water and found a three-foot carp in my basement a couple days later. Did you lose your car, too? I lost my two cars, and um, as did most people in Little Ferry, right. because that's the way everybody got around. But my folks I checked on, and my dad and mom refused to leave the house. So my sister, who lives in New Providence, went up to Vermont and picked up a couple of generators, came back a couple of days after we sat there with a little generator, and um, we survived. We put the generators to use. We heated mom's house. Um, I spent my, most of my days there 
back and forth, checking on everything, and then people came to clean the church. They were there at the outset of the storm. So we knew that they were like storm chasers, but they were there to help us clean up. And we asked them to start at the, st the hall first. But hold on. You started getting people to come in to the parish hall, and at a certain point, between 250 and 300 people were coming into the parish hall as their place, as th that's where they were. Was it? That, the, actually, St. Margaret's is the center of the town, perhaps. Uh, it was the center of everybody's town at that point, because they could walk there. And they came with their uh, carts and their anything that they could bring. And people who heard that we needed it, Steve, came out and supported us no matter what. People, we had people cooking for us. We had people dropping off food, um, little things like uh, paper towel and toilet tissue and just food that you could get through without cooking, we needed. Peanut butter and, and things like that. They dropped off cases. It came through UPS. It came through um, Walmart brought water in. Um, the places brought cleaning supplies. What was your role? Um, I was the mouthpiece. Um, I was able to put everything together. Um, I, the volunteers of Bergen County came through and got me more people to come and help. Um, my phone number was given out and we actually played a role, I played a role in putting it all together. Getting the food at the tables, getting the, you know, um, things set up so that the, the people could come to a place where they knew it was safe, they knew it was dry, they knew it was in walking distance, and they could survive a little bit. What made you know that you had to do this? If not me, then who? There's no, I mean, I had, I actually had the keys to the kingdom. Being the trustee at St. Margaret's, I had the keys. Um, the pastor at this time was dying. He had melanoma and he was in Villa Marie Claire. And unbeknownst to me, he was evacuated and, and moved around. Um, he had given me the blessing to use all of the facilities that we had. And um, I think he's watching me today. I think, I know he's watching me today. Um, but um, he uh, let us use it during Irene. So we just continued and uh, we made it a place where people could come to pick up things that they might have needed and lost. What's the biggest message? I mean, you were the $50,000 winner today amongst some pretty special people, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I am hum humbled and honored that it was me, I mean. Yeah, but uh, you saw the reaction to you. Um, what would be the message that you would want to share with everyone watching on public television right now who say, hey, that's amazing. That, that Regina, she's, she's something, but I, I, I'm not that kind of person. You say? Everybody, everybody really is that kind of person. You pay it forward just a little bit. Um, some people have it better than others. You just help one another. Um, Mother Teresa used to say about the pebble, and that's what was spoken about today. The ripple? The ripple effect from a pebble. If you throw a pebble in the water, it has ripples. We can all be a pebble, but we certainly can be a ripple. That's what Angelica said. Yeah, that's what Angelica, and that's what Mother Teresa said too. We can all be, we don't have to be the pebble, but you can be the ripple. Just keep it going. Just pay it forward. You feel good about this? I do. I do, but God is good to me. God has been really, really good to me. Um, my house is on the mend. Most houses in Little Ferry are, are still on the mend. Um, we put forward great programs with the help of uh, United Way the help of Habitat for Humanity, who's working diligently to get these people to, you know, to some set of normalcy. I don't know if there's going to be a, a normal for Little Fairy Munaki. I don't know what a, a normal would be. Um, I've got hope for he hope and healing, helping the kids get through the stress. Um, we deal with the mental and emotional, psychological issues of people affected by this storm. And not just the children, but the adults too. You know, and I think now uh, we were a very strong and very... Um, uh, that nobody wanted the work to be done in their homes because it was messy. And a lot of the people are very proud. My problem is now is as, as this heat comes, we're going to have more mold coming up the walls. Um, so our people are in it for the long run. You are a role model for all of us, and you make a huge difference, and uh, you embody everything that uh, the Rustbury um, Award for Making a Difference uh, was created to accomplish. So congratulations. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org, visit us online at oneonone.org, or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. We have Dr. Brian Pfister, who is Associate Professor, Department of Biomedical Engineering at NJIT. Good to see you, doctor. 
Pleasure to be here. Now, break this down. We Sometimes we have scientists here who are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but you are talking about uh, stretching axons, Correct. the part of uh, the nerve cell that sends electrical impulses. Talk to us, and why have you brought Silly Putty to break <laughs> this down? Go ahead, talk to us. Okay, so the, what my area of research is in traumatic brain injury. That's where we're looking at how the brain gets damaged to some sort of physical insult. The axons are these wires, as you had mentioned, that uh, connect all the different neurons in the brain that send the signals around the brain. And in many brain injuries, we lose those wires, then we lose the signal. The reason I brought the silly putty is to give you an example of how the different types of injuries might lead to different types of brain injuries. So for example, if you're in an automobile accident, you might expect to be um, in a different situation than if you were playing football or if you were in uh, a war and got exposed to um, some sort of blast wave. So the mm -hmm. type of brain injury matters a great deal with respect to what? To the physical insult, the, the, the traumatic <clears throat> event that occurs. And if I may, sure. I brought a little childhood to uh, toy here called Silly Putty. Got it. Right? I this is what it. we call a viscoelastic material. Which a visco? Viscoelastic material. Got it. Visco meaning it's a little bit of fluid. It flows. Elastic meaning it has some structure to it, so it's a it's a solid. And the key is is that the rate at which you work with it, or how fast you p apply your forces, determines on how the material behaves. So if I stretch it slow, right, right, it stretches. If I pull it fast, Oof. it breaks, right. Got it. And then if I even go to a much much larger rate, so you can think about something that might get towards closer to a blast, it bounces. Right? So it bounces and it doesn't deform. So the rate at which you apply the forces to the material determine on how but, it behaves. But, but, now, were they supposed to replicate certain kinds of injuries? Absolutely. So the idea is now you start thinking about brain as being something more like jello than silly putty. Right? Right. So if you deform it slow, if I took silly putty and shook guys, it on give a me plate. Silly putty back, guys. This is a brain. Don't be it's a brain. around like yes, that. Exactly. Uh, so now if we look at something like Jell-O, uh, right. if we shake it on a plate, it wiggles, right? And if we start, if we look at something, uh, and brain's going to be a little bit more like Jell-O-like than, yep. than uh, Silly Putty-like. Not as elastic. Not as elastic. Well, actually, y y softer Got in it. a sense, right? Because it's more squishy. But in a very similar rate, at much higher rates, if I was to um, expose Jello to extremely high rates of force, then it would start as, um, behaving more solid-like, like the silly putty did when I dropped it on the floor. I stretch it slow, it deforms. I drop it on the ground, it bounces, and it does not deform. In fact, if you took silly putty and shot a gun at it, it would actually shatter into a bunch of little pieces. So it's the rate at which you deliver but, the force. But doctor, ultimately, in layperson's mm -hmm. language, when it really comes down to people are watching right now saying, okay, this is well, fascinating. Yeah. What does it mean in terms of the treatment of these injuries? Well, what we're thinking is, is that the different forces can lead to different types of brain injuries. So if you're in an automobile accident, it would be a much slower force application to the head than if you were in um, a blast wave, right? So the blast is extremely fast. The blast wave happens on the order of microseconds where a automobile accident, your brain goes through forces that occur over several milliseconds, several hundred milliseconds, in fact. So what happens is we're finding that the different types of insults to the head mm. are leading to different types of brain injuries. So in an automobile accident, a lot of people can come out with very severe injuries, very slow injury, a lot of deformation of the brain tissue, a lot of damage occurring. In a blast wave, we don't really see that injury as much. We do, can't image it. We can't. It's on the MRI, doesn't it's it show up? It's not on the MRI. It's no. not on the MRI. No, it is not. So yeah. they, what do they look the same? These axons are microscopic, right? These okay. connections are microscopic. They're you can't see them in the MRI. Exactly. So Muhammad Ali boxing or others who are boxing are getting multiple you know, mm -hmm. hits to the brain. Something's happening to the brain, right. right? Right. Football player, multiple concussions. Something's happening right. to the brain. They can't image it. They right? can't image it. So they're going off of symptoms when someone comes in. So the biggest problem we have now, you know, 1.7 million Americans have a brain injury each year, right? There's a huge percentage of them that are mild. 
some that might not even go to the hospital because they don't recognize right. until weeks, months later, they can't remember things, right. they're angry, they're not getting along with their wife, they're having a tough time with their but job. But your research potentially could do what? What we're trying to do is we're trying to understand what is happening at that microscopic scale. So since we can't image it, we try to understand what is happening to the nervous system under these different types of physical forces that replicate the brain injury to try to understand what's happening to the nervous system. If we understand what's happening to the nervous system as a result of the damaging forces, that gives us what we call targets that we can try to mend, right? So if we don't know what we want to fix, then it's hard to pick a treatment strategy to try to fix or cure the problem. You know, as I'm listening to you, doctor, I'm realizing you're talking about the scientific process, which is slow by right. layperson's inter a layperson's right. interpretation like mine, which is methodical, which it needs to be, Correct. which has to have all these controls. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, and so what's the solution? Right. It doesn't work that way. Correct. It does not. By design. By design, right. So if, you know, when a doctor wants to come in and say, okay, you have a brain injury or you have something wrong with you, you have diabetes. Okay, well, if you have diabetes, I know right. that we need to look at an insulin issue. Here's right? the That's protocol. A target. That's a target. We know yes. what we're going to happen. We know what the problem brain is. Brain injury is different. We don't know what the problem is. Right. We don't know how to fix it. So how do you pick a treatment? We're way behind book? on this. Correct. So you have to understand what the problem is first. This is fascinating work. How, right. One minute left. Why okay. is this your field of research? <laughs> That's actually in a one long, minute or less. <laughs> one long uh, in, in, in or less. I actually worked with uh, some colleagues that approached me one time and said, "Do you know what this term is?" And they said, "DAI. It stands for diffuse axonal injury, <laughs> and it's this mechanical uh, damaging of the nervous system." that leads to all this what's going on and I was a mechanical engineer wanting to get into biomedical sciences. Were you hooked? And I was hooked from that moment. Well you and your colleagues at NJIT are doing groundbreaking work. Thank you. Um, every time we have one of your colleagues on we learn something new. Dr. Brian Pfister, Associate Professor at Department of Biomedical Engineering at NJIT. We appreciate you teaching us and we'll try to, I'll try to be more patient. Thank, <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Fedway Associates, Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation, Cone Resnick, New Jersey Natural Gas, Verizon Communications, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger and NJ.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. For 17 years, the Russell Berry Foundation has recognized unsung heroes in New Jersey who have done extraordinary things for others. If you know a New Jersey resident whose selfless or heroic actions make them worthy of recognition, you can nominate them to receive the Russell Berry Making a Difference Award. With annual cash prizes of up to $50,000, this award can make a significant difference for a very deserving person. Nominations are accepted online.